So I'm on Twitter, at WatkinsDJ. Give me a follow. But here's the thing, I don't think I'm very good at Twitter. And that's because I've never been in a Twitter beef. And so far as I can tell, that's kind of the point of Twitter, right? To start some sort of fight with some person that you may or may not know, and, you know, hit him with as many witty and sort of biting comments as you can think of. In a lot of ways, the French Revolution was just like Twitter. Revolutionaries were constantly denouncing each other, not with phones and the internet, but by using the National Convention's podium and in newspapers and pamphlets. The main difference is that on Twitter, there's never really a winner. I mean, the Twitter arguments that happen every single day don't inevitably lead to one person getting kicked off Twitter and expelled from the internet altogether. But in the French Revolution, victors did emerge. In this video, we're going to look at the victory of one particular faction, the Montagnards, or in other words, the Jacobins. We're going to look at how they achieved their victory and what it meant for the revolution. Okay, let's get going. In this video, you're going to need something to take notes with, and two primary sources, the circular letter of the Parisian Jacobins, and a speech by Guadet. Our story about the triumph of the Montagnards begins a little bit back in time, right at the beginning of 1793. In order to understand what happened with the Montagnards and how they rose to power, we need to understand a little bit about the context of those early months of that year. Okay, let's do a little review. What was the situation in France in March 1793? Well, first things first, the king was no more. As you probably remember, King Louis XVI was tried and executed by the state guillotine on January 21st, 1793. In sole control of the mechanisms of government was the newly established National Convention, who proclaimed that France was henceforth a republic and that all political will in the country was vested in the convention. The convention, however, was not a unified body. There were many groups competing for influence and for their own agendas. The main divide, if you remember, was between the Montagnards, or the Mountain, and the Girondins. Both groups came from the Jacobin Club, but they gradually divided over a host of issues, including the war, what to do with the king, and various other policies to pursue in the convention. Third, France was at war. Initially, war was simply with Austria and Prussia, but by the early months of 1793, that war had expanded. Now France was fighting Austria, Prussia, Britain, the Netherlands, Spain, the Kingdom of Sardinia, and eventually Russia. In brief, France was up against nearly every major power in Europe. Fourth, war had also broken out at home. In the Vendée, royalist peasants had banded together to resist the convention and its representatives. Fifth, France had been plagued by a variety of high-profile defections from formerly notable revolutionaries. By far the most impactful was that of General Lafayette in August 1792, but reports of other betrayals also shocked revolutionaries. And finally, France had just suffered through what Tim Tackett and others have called the First Terror. The September massacres led to the deaths of some 1,400 Parisian prisoners. Political mechanisms had broken down. The convention was still battling with the Paris Commune for control over the populace. In brief, the moment was one of instability and discord. And it was in this moment that the convention undertook a number of measures in order to regain control of France. On March 9th, the convention empowered some 80 of its deputies to serve as representatives on mission. Deputies were given total political power and told to proceed to the various departments of France and ensure that the decrees of the National Convention were being enforced. On the next day, the convention created the Revolutionary Tribunal, an extraordinary court tasked with only trying cases of counter-revolution and treason. The tribunal was an extraordinary court in that it did not work within the existing judicial system. In other words, those convicted could not avail themselves to the normal measures of appeal. 
the tribunal's ruling was final. The tribunal was set up, no surprises here, in Paris also, so its proceedings could be centralized and easily controlled by members of the convention. Then, on March 21st, the convention passed a law that mandated that every arrondissement, every neighborhood of every city and town in France, had to set up what was called a watch committee. Watch committees were made of locals and tasked with surveillance of their community to be, lookout, to be on the lookout for counter-revolutionary behaviors. Watch committees were often the bodies that accused people of treason and sent them before the tribunal where they were tried and heard. Finally, on April 6th, the convention set up the Committee for Public Safety, a committee of deputies tasked with safeguarding the nation, but effectively, really, given executive powers of the state. Gradually, this committee would come to wield nearly the entire mechanism of power in France. These various measures were successful in consolidating power in the convention and in bringing the first terror to a close, yet they also produced an opportunity. For though the convention was divided in March 1793, if one group could emerge victorious with the new mechanisms of the state all tied to the convention's authority, that group would wield near total power over France. The stage was now set for the battle royale in the National Convention. The factionalism that had dominated the assembly since the beginning of the revolution was about to be over, or at least for a little bit. And the first step towards that had to do with the expulsion of the Girondins. Factionalism long preceded the National Convention. Jacobins, Girondins, Fouillants, Royalists, they'd all fought each other for the preceding years of the Revolution. But the girondins montagnard fight had come to the fore in the wake of the Convention and became the most important one in France. Robespierre and the Montagnards continually linked the Girondins to the king and to royalism, in large part because many Girondins had served as some of Louis's ministers, and many Girondins had pushed for softer penalties on the king in the wake of his conviction. Yet the event that really polarized this divide irreparably was the September Massacres. During the massacres, Robespierre had given a speech to the Paris Insurrectionary Commune, accusing the Girondins of plotting with the Duke of Brunswick and the enemies of France. Shortly thereafter, the Commune gave orders to arrest Brissot, Roland, and other leading Girondins. The arrests didn't take place, and it was a good thing for the Girondins, for it was the people placed in Parisian prisons in late August and early September that became the main victims of the massacres. The Girondin leaders believed that the attempt to have them arrested was simply an assassination attempt on the part of the Commune and the Montagnards who backed it. As Madame Roland, the wife of the minister Jean-Marie Roland, and an incredibly important voice among the Girondins and many in revolutionary Paris, said, Robespierre and Marat have a knife to our throats. As the Girondins mobilized to figure out a plan to battle their political rivals, however, disaster struck. General du Maurier, victor of Valmy and savior of France, turned against the revolution. Having lost decisively in a battle at Nierwinden in March 18th, du Maurier single-handedly negotiated a truce with the Austrians, but only on the condition that he evacuate his troops from Belgium and march on Paris. Du Maurier himself was frustrated with the convention, and particularly with the increasingly radical Montagnards, and thus was willing to do it, to turn against Paris. He arrested the representatives on mission sent to him from the convention, turned them over to the Austrians, in fact, as prisoners, and on March 27th declared his resistance to the convention. On April, 8, on April 5th, excuse me, he gave the command to his troops to march on Paris, but the troops refused. Dumouriez subsequently defected and turned himself in to the Austrians. This was a disaster for the Girondins, because Du Maurier himself was a close ally of many of the Girondins, having served as a minister alongside them. When news of Du Maurier's treason reached Paris, the Girondins were quickly excoriated in newspapers and speeches. On April 11th, Robespierre denounced many Girondin leaders by name in the convention as part of a, quote, profoundly corrupt conspiracy, a conspiracy to sabotage the revolution and indeed the entire nation. The Girondins defended themselves by counterattacking and trying to increase the pressure on their political rivals. In particular, they targeted one particular enemy, Jean-Paul Marat, arch Montagnard and now deputy in the convention, whose popularity came from his incredibly radical and violent newspaper, L'Ami du Peuple, that had at one time called for the murder of hundreds of thousands of people in order to safeguard the revolution. 
the Girondins blamed Marat for the September massacres and said that he must be held accountable. On April 12th, they convinced enough moderates of the Plain, the group of deputies not firmly associated with either the Montagnards or the Girondins, to vote with them to impeach Marat from the convention. Later, they had the Revolutionary Tribunal call for his arrest and trial. Yet the counteroffensive that the Girondins undertook eventually failed. On April 24th, after a fairly quick trial, the tribunal acquitted Marat. The irascible Montagnard was carried out of the chambers on the shoulders of Parisian sans-culottes as the crowd cheered, Vive Marat! and gave him a crown of leaves to wear on his head. The Girondins had clearly lost in their attempt to seize the mechanisms of power. And this is when the tables turned on the Girondins. The Parisian sans culottes wanted to hold the Girondins accountable not only for their anti sans culottes policies, such as the promotion of free grain policies, but also for their attempt to attack popular heroes, such as Marat. They organized a march on the convention in May 27th, which prompted the Girondin Maxime Isnard's famous declaration that Paris would be annihilated if the sans culottes continued to interfere with the convention. And then, of course, came the even larger marches on May 31st and June 2nd that eventually brought about the final downfall of the Girondin. Over 20 Girondin leaders were impeached from their spots in the convention. And now the convention belonged almost entirely to their rivals. Placed under house arrest, many Girondin feared that to stay in Paris was to face certain death. So many arranged to escape the city. Buzo, Barbaro, Guadet, Louvet, Petion, and Roland, though not his wife, whom he shamefully left behind, all of them managed to flee Paris. Brissot tried to get away, but he was apprehended outside of Chartres, his hometown, and sent back to the capital. Moshi Rondon headed north to the city of Caen, where the Federalist revolt had just commenced. They wanted to try to convince those revolting in Normandy to create an army to march on Paris and take control of the convention by force. Their attempt never came to fruition, but the very attempt itself made clear that the Girondins were now completely removed from power in Paris. Gone or imprisoned, they no longer played a major role in French politics. We've heard a lot about factionalism and its effects, and now I want you to take a look at it for yourself a little bit more closely. So I want you to pause this video and take a look at the two primary sources that I mentioned earlier, the circular letter from the Parisian Jacobin Club and the speech by Guadet. We're not going to dig into these primary sources right now. We'll leave that for class. But I do want to say one quick thing. These documents show you what the culture of denunciation looked like. This is how factionalism took on a life of its own. These documents also show you how factionalism contributed to and was fed by the fear of counter-revolution. In these documents you see, and in the context of the spring of 1793, you sort of understand that there was no room for seeing eye to eye, right? There was no room for connection between the various factions that were competing with each other in the National Convention. The, the, the revolutionaries of the convention uh, didn't look at the people across the aisle and see fellow French revolutionaries or even fellow French citizens. Instead, political enemies became conspirators and traitors. With the Girondins gone, you'd think that the Montagnards would have smooth sailing from this point forward, but the reality is that there were still some challenges to meet. First, of course, there was the persistent challenge of the Fédéré and those who still sided with the Girondins. Of course, many cities took up this cause via open revolt, but it also reached individual citizens. And perhaps the greatest sign of this was the famous incident of the death of Marat. It came at the hands of a woman from Caen in Normandy, the city that was revolting as a part of the Federalist revolts, Charlotte Corday d'Armont. On July 13, 1793, Corday showed up in Paris at the home of Marat, asking to see the revolutionary leader in order to share with him a list of Girondin conspirators. She gained entry, and while Marat lay in a bathtub, a result of his debilitating psoriasis, he pl she plunged a knife into his chest. Corday didn't run. The police took her into custody, and she didn't even deny that she killed Marat. Rather, her actions were to be seen, seen as an example and as a message. In fact, she even wrote a letter to explain all of her actions. 
In her trial, which happened just days later, she defended herself only by twisting Marat's famous words, saying, I knew that Marat was perverting France. I have killed one man to save a hundred thousand. Corday was a revolutionary and a supporter of the Girondins. She was no royalist. And she was among the last desperate efforts of those supporters of the Girondin to stop the Montagnard takeover of the country. She was executed by guillotine on July 17, 1793. Yet Girondin assassins were not the only challenge that the Montagnards still had to face. They also had to shore up their base, as it were, and make certain that the very Parisian sans culotte who had challenged their enemies, and as a result propelled them to the top of the convention, continued to support them. And this was difficult because the Sanskrit law continued to put pressure on the National Convention. In the winter and spring of 1793, they were particularly upset about bread prices. Once again, not a major surprise. Another lackluster harvest had led to spiking prices, and late in February 1793, a group of Parisian women once again went to municipal authorities demanding support and the passing of laws that would set price controls on bread and other essential goods. Bread riots eventually broke out in the city, and many Montagnards found themselves actually denouncing the riots and calling for order, a stance that put them in danger of the same sorts of pressure from the sans culottes the Girondins were facing. That danger was real, in large part because there were members of the Montagnards, or rather a sort of offshoot of the Montagnards, that had aligned themselves entirely with the Parisian sans culottes Labeled the enragés, or madmen, by the Girondins, they included Jacques-René Hébert, the author of the unsavory and radical newspaper Le Père Duchesne, Jacques Roux, a former priest turned radical and participant in the Paris Commune, and François Henriot, a commander in the National Guard and one of the architects of the May 31st and June 2nd journée that expelled the Girondins. The enragés pushed for more of a direct democracy model of governance, as well as strict government controls of the economic uh, system. They wanted price levels for foodstuffs set by the government and harsh punishments for hoarders and speculators. In a manifesto given before the convention on June 25, 1793, Wu controversially trumpeted, Freedom is but an empty illusion when one class of men can starve another with impunity. Equality is but an empty illusion when the rich through monopolies, have the decision of life or death over their own kind. The Republic is but an empty illusion when the counter-revolution takes place daily because three-quarters of the citizenry, citizenry cannot afford the, base, the price of basic foodstuffs, and no one sheds a tear. Put briefly, the enragé pressured the Montagnards from their own flank, seeking to push them to align even more closely with the sans culotte and its desires. The people most concerned with this pressure from the left was Maximilien Robespierre and his associates in the Committee of Public Safety. In July 1793, Robespierre joined 11 others, including fellow Montagnards Collot d'Herbois, Georges Couton, and Louis-Antoine Saint-Just, to form a new Committee of Public Safety, this one completely purged of Girondin. It was these 12 who would slowly consolidate all of the convention's powers into that one committee. To do that, however, they needed to ensure that they would not be troubled by the enragé or the sans culotte who followed them. So, the Committee of Public Safety undertook a sort of carrot-and-stick effort to both suppress rowdy enragé and placate the Parisian crowd. They undertook, for example, a campaign of denunciations against Roux in newspapers, comparing his threatening rhetoric to that of the Vendeans and labeling him an enemy of the state. He was imprisoned in August 1793 under charges of embezzlement and corruption. On the other side, Hébert was co-opted into the Mountainyard cause. Together with Robespierre, Hébert helped get Roux himself expelled from the Cordelier Club. And Robespierre and the Committee for Public Safety began to pursue policies supported by the Enrage in order to placate some and win over the Parisian crowd. The two most significant ones were a decree against profiteering, that declared that the creation of monopolies was to be a capital crime and made hoarding punishable by death. And a second law, the long-awaited general maximum, that set the highest possible price for such goods as meat, butter, wine, beer, firewood, candles, salt, sugar, paper, iron, copper, linens, woolens, soap, tobacco, and, of course, bread. But the Montagnard Convention also passed a law 
that gave a stipend to all sans-culottes who had participated in the enragé led journée of May 31st and June 2nd. Finally, the Montagnards sealed the deal with the Parisian sans culotte by feting sans culotte heroes, most notably Marat. They supported a measure that placed a bust of Marat on a pedestal in the halls of the National Convention. His heart was suspended in an urn from the roof of the Cordelier Club. His mistress, the quote-unquote widow Marat, was given a state pension, and his ashes were given a place of honor in the new revolutionary mausoleum, the Pantheon. The cumulative effect of all of these measures was in the short term to win the undying support of the Parisian sans culottes to the cause of the Montagnards, and, more specifically, to the cause of Robespierre and the rest of the Committee of Public Safety. The Montagnards had, at last, won France. And it was at this point that the newly crowned Montagnards made clear the new direction of this government. In a series of speeches at the convention on September 5th, 1793, Montagnards, both within the Committee of Public Safety and outside of it, laid out a radical agenda. Pierre Gaspard Chomet declared to the Assembly, You have passed wise laws, laws that promise happiness, but they have not been implemented because the power to do so is lacking. If you do not create that power quickly, these laws risk becoming obsolete almost at birth. At this very moment, the enemies of the state are raising their swords against it. Every day we learn of new betrayals and new crimes. Every day we become upset at the discovery and the reappearance of new conspiracies. Your fate and ours is tied to the unvarying establishment of the Republic. We must either destroy its enemies, or they will destroy us. Finally, Bertrand Barrère concluded, It is time that equality bore its scythe above all heads. It is time to horrify all conspirators. So, legislators, place terror as the order of the day. Let us be in revolution because everywhere counter-revolution is being woven by our enemies. The blade of the law should hover over all of the guilty. And at this, the convention broke out in applause and the French government formally adopted a policy of state-instituted terror. We are now officially in the Great Terror. We're going to spend the next two videos exploring what the terror was and what it did in France, but it's important to take just a second to think about and reflect on how we got here. Factionalism, extraordinary events, war, ideological radicalization, all of these factors contributed to the origins of the terror. And it's important to kind of think about and connect what we see in this moment to the things that we've seen since the beginning of this course, really, or at least since the beginning of when we started tracking the revolution weeks ago. Right from the very get-go, there were elements of the revolution that contributed to this radicalization process. But we can't overlook the events that also proved to be turning points, events that polarized people from each other, events that, that um, set up new contexts that radicalized the politics and the behaviors of people in Paris and the rest of France. The terror is an extraordinary period in the revolution, but it's one that makes sense within the context of lots of things that were going on from the very beginning of the revolution itself. More to come on this story, stay tuned, and uh, until then, good job, good luck, see you in class.